kind of fine-grained research. It's something that uh, the Connecticut Historical Commission did when I was an employee there. And I became involved with the Jewish Historical Society in a project where we realized that we had a lot of information about big white congregational churches and next to no information about synagogues. So as we started to research synagogues statewide, all of a sudden synagogues in these country settings came up. And it was like, why would there be a synagogue on that four corner? Because my original thinking was, oh, these are all going to be in urban settings, all to be, at least in uh, communities large enough to have downtown shopping areas and be big enough to support a synagogue. And yet, here was a half dozen country synagogues. And we wondered, how did they get there? So after we completed that project, over the years we researched this topic. The Jewish Historical Society has done many, many, many oral interviews and tape recorded those, have transcribed those with farming descendants and Jewish farmers. So we wanted to take that material and put it in book form. Now I can say that this is a huge topic. This is, so there's two types of history. There's history that's Topic. So, the, um, as the project went along, we came up with the book that you see the cover of here. Uh, I work with Estelle Kafer at the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford, which is in uh, West Hartford, and they've kind of adopted the farming era at Jews have carved out lives as farmers, 
bringing the, to the experience innovations that would distinguish them as outstanding in the field. Though forbidden to own land in Russia and the Russian-occupied uh, countries, Jews still came to America with some agricultural skills, gained through cattle dealing, uh, tenant farming, or raising cows, chickens, or goats. In Connecticut, Jewish farmers moved past those basics, pioneering the adoption of foodstuffs such as eggs, milk, and broilers that could be raised on worn out, rocky New England soil. After all, rocks are known as Connecticut potatoes. <laughs> Tobacco cultivation also proved a money maker for these Jews. Beyond specific crops, though, large scale use of scientifically designed chicken coops, the Jewish uh, farm agent, the Jewish farm newspaper, and the uh, Jewish Farmers Cooperative all became highly visible <coughs> hallmarks of Jewish success at farming in Connecticut. Similarly, the Farmers Credit Union in Fairfield, formed by the Jewish Agricultural Society in 1911, was among the first in the nation to create a model that was soon adopted across the country. Now, coming to Connecticut, and you can see uh, this big newspaper article is talking about the Jewish Agricultural Aid Society, which we'll talk about in a minute, and trying to make farming attractive to newcomers. These are chickens on the Himmelstein farm. The masses of Eastern European Jews began immigrating to the United States in the 1880s. Between 1881 and 1924, more than two and a half million Jews arrived from America, the overwhelming bulk of them either directly or indirectly from Eastern Europe. Eastern European Jewish immigrants settled largely in, in favor of cities in the Northeast and the Midwest. New York City alone was home to an estimated one-third of all the Jews living in the United States in 1880. With its proximity to New York, Connecticut developed a substantial Jewish community. By 1910, Hartford counted more than 6,500 Jews among its citizens, and approximately 5,000 having arrived from Eastern, European, Eastern Europe within the preceding three decades. Uh, in the, in the leaving Eastern Europe, uh, these Jewish immigrants fled nearly two centuries of persecution that only became more pronounced after the assassination of the Russian Tsar, Alexander II, in 1881. They experienced pogroms, which were legalized riots, basically, against uh, Jews, where property and lives were taken, and it was condoned by the government. The earliest article that we could find on these new immigrants in the Hartford Current is in 1882. A Hartford, the Hartford Current reporter uh, announced in the paper, when asked whether these Russian Jews expect to abide permanently in this country or return to their native land, the reply was they have come for good. Beginning with that earliest wave of Jewish refugees in 1881 that flooded Brody, a western Ukrainian town on the Austrian border, Few Jews had the resources to provide themselves with the basics, food, shelter, and clothing. Arriving in, in Connecticut, Eastern European Jews found an existing community of German Jews who had come uh, during the earlier part of the 19th century and had settled in the state cities. And I understand you've had a presentation on the G. Fox Empire. Uh, Gershon Fox was one of those German Jews that came to Hartford and started as a peddler and then worked his way up to become a property owner and a real realtor, or I mean a retailer. Um, in, eight, in 1843, the German Jews successfully petitioned the state legislature to amend the state statutes to permit public worship by Jews, and they quickly formed orthodox congregations in the state's largest cities. Beginning in the 1870s, many German Jews adopted the practices of Reform Judaism, which allowed them to assimilate more easily or quickly into their new communities. Divided by language, culture, etc., German Jews did not speak Yiddish, Eastern European Jews normally did, and class, the members of the Connecticut's German Jewish community nevertheless worked to assist these new arrivals, their co-religionists, Eastern European Jews. In 1882, they established the Society for the Aid of Russian Refugees. This is in Hartford. A brief notice appeared under the headline, The Russian Refugees, in the Hartford Current, June 28, 1882, announced the organization's mission and asked for donations. Uh, this was in the paper. The committee of the local Russian aid society engaged in the relief of the Russian Jew Jewish re refugees in this, in this city 
uh, request assistance from the public. Money may be sent to the current office and will be duly acknowledged in these columns, or assistance may be given by procuring employment. Hartford has received a large number of these refugees. Work has been found for 200 in factories and on farms, and others are arriving daily. Directed by L.B. Haas, a Hartford tobacco merchant whose family had immigrated from Holland, the Society for the Aid of Russian Refugees belonged to an international network of aid organizations that sought permanent homes for those affected by pogroms. Haas himself attended a meeting in New York City in June of 1882, called by the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society of the United States, and attended by individuals representing nearly 25 separate relief organizations. That was something that, you know, in some ways was a little unexpected when we started this project. Because we started out with trying to figure out why these country synagogues were on four corners out in the field somewhere in Connecticut. And then all of a sudden, as we researched it, realized it was part of a monumental international aid effort. So uh, the uh, group in Hartford helped to facilitate Jews to come directly from Liverpool, from England, through an group, international group called the British National Mansion House Committee, which was one of the earliest groups to really look at relocating these Jewish immigrants. And in the first years, the Hartford Aid Society often found work for newcomers in factories, such as the Panema Mills near Norwich, or the Eagle Lock Company in Terraville. But the idea of rural resettlement which had been used by American charity workers since the 1850s as a, as a way of dealing with the nation's urban poor was clearly under consideration. In, in a Hartford Current article, a representative of the Hartford AIDS Society lists farmers as one of the uh, trades that new immigrants uh, could follow. And so farming was in there right off the bat. Uh, it also noted the existence of cooperative farming ventures in Oregon and Louisiana. Locally, Jewish immigrants had been placed as workers on New England farms, and while some, did, quote, vigorously objected to working on Saturdays and eating meat not slaughtered in accordance with Jewish rights, unquote, the society's representative nevertheless claimed that uh, Connecticut Jews saw agriculture as an avenue to prosperity. This is, a this is one of those guides for immigrants. This one was published in Yiddish and in English. So if you get, when you got off and you were in Ellis Island, you, there would be representatives from these aid societies. And in this little booklet, it already talks about farming. You have a hard time hearing? Yes. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Sure. And on top of that, they're delivering books out front. I really want to know. Okay. Okay. Is there a switch on it? Yeah, there is, and it's on. I'll try to talk louder. All right, I'm sorry, really. Now, this is the Bear de Hirsch. Uh, the most significant support for Jewish farmers in Connecticut came from European sources. The Bear Maurice de Hirsch, 1831 to 1896, was an extremely wealthy German Jew, here, pictured here, who amassed a fortune as an industrialist and the builder of railroads. Hirsch became a strong proponent of the Jewish back to the land movement, an international effort to resettle persecuted Jews in rural colonies that stressed the redemptive nature of farm life. His only son had died as a young man, and it prompted him to devote much of his fortune to philanthropy. In 1881, he donated one million francs to ease the Jewish refugee situation in Eastern Europe. Convinced that Jews did not have a bright future under Russian rule, he became interested in their immigration to the United States. The New York-based Baron de Hirsch Fund's first agricultural efforts were directed at revitalizing some floundering Jewish farm colonies in New Jersey that had been established in the 1880s. Uh, the fund purchased a 5,300-acre tract in Woodbine, New Jersey to establish its industrial agricultural community. And in 1894, the Baron de Hirsch Fund Agricultural School was established. In the United States, the fund devoted sub, uh, substantial financial resources to the Jewish Agricultural and Industrial Aid Society, 
which was founded in 1890, actually 1900 in New York City, and was largely operated by American-born Jews of German descent. Having achieved a measure of success in business, these German Jews worried about the high numbers of Eastern European Jews living in crowded, filthy conditions in a tiny area on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And they feared that these impoverished Jews with their foreign dress, language, diet, and customs would arouse virulent anti-Semitism in America. These sentiments, sentiments helped to drive that charitable impulse to move people out into the country. Under the auspices of the Jewish Agricultural and Industrial Aid Society, Jews were sent to become farmers not only in rural Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, but to far-flung places with picturesque names like Bad Axe, Michigan, and Painted Woods, North Dakota. <laughs> As the name implied, originally the Jewish Agricultural and Industrial Aid Society was going to work on a two-prong method, where they were going to resettle people to do agricultural work and resettle people out out of New York City to do industrial work. They tried to buy a factory in Colchester, Connecticut, and it suspiciously burned to the ground. And the industrial idea never really took off, even though they had a bureau called the Industrial Aid, Industrial Removable, Industrial Removal Society. And so if you've ever seen that in any of your family literature, Industrial Removal struck me as odd when I first read it. But it was because they, they wanted to move people out to where work was out of New York City. But they dropped the industrial side of it pretty early on. So uh, they, they went to totally supporting agricultural re, uh, efforts. They would try to help create a, new mar a nearby market for per uh, perishable produce. They provide farmers with opportunities for additional employment during the winter months. And eventually, they, they also provided small loans and mortgages. Jewish farmers living near Colchester, New London, Norwich, and Wilmanic, and where other areas where factories could be found, often subsidized their farm income by working as tailors, shoemakers, or butchers, trade that they had brought over from the old country. In 1891, the New London Day reported on the volume of garment piecework being done in the tiny community of Chesterfield, which is in Montville, reporting that Jewish locals could be found going, quote, full blast, unquote, assembling such garments as suspenders, pants, and coats in their homes. The fact that many of the peace workers were recent immigrants did not escape the day reporter, who uh, compared the, quote, plodding ways of the, quote, old settlers, meaning non-Jews, to the newcomer, newcomers having turned their hands so easily to various industries. In Colchester, they, as I said, they tried to buy a factory, which was just really suspiciously burned to the ground. Uh, in 1907, they abandoned the efforts to <coughs> industry, and they reorganized their agricultural department. Jewish farmers started to fan out across the, the state. Early on, the organization pinpointed two areas that, in which to establish independent Jewish-owned and run farms. One encompassing the towns of Colchester and Lebanon uh, and the village of Chesterfield and Montville, and the other in the towns of Vernon, Ellington, and Summers. In each of these areas, the town financed the construction of a synagogue, one in Colchester in 1892 and another in Ellington in 1915, knowing that such a facility was essential to the creation of a Jewish community. The Back to the Land movement could only succeed if Jewish farm farmers were able to worship, keep kosher, and maintain cultural ties to Orthodox tradition. This, is, this, this farm, the Himmelstein farm in Lebanon, it's been in the same family now for over 100 years. Actually, it's on its fourth generation of Himmelstein farmers, and several of those generations have actually been educated at the Agricultural College at UConn. Uh, a lot of times, you know, these were farmsteads that had existing buildings on them, large buildings that included things like scientific theory on poultry raising. When I saw this building originally, I thought it was some kind of rural mill, actually. But it's a, it's coops, it's farm chicken coops in a, in a large, almost industrial type building. And then those eggs were shipped by trolley and later by truck to market. Uh, 
Often older buildings were recycled as you could build a newer home. This is a, a small 18th century house that was first the, the home of the Jewish farmer family, and then as they could uh, build a newer home, it was turned into a barn. This is Chesterfield in Montville. This is a, this tiny settlement that in 1892 received money to build a synagogue and to create a Jewish community. The synagogue burned in the 1970s due to arson, but it's a state register archeological site now. So, we've got <laughs> Jews standing out by farms. One of the myths that we, I think we've dispelled is this concept that Jews were sort of all by themselves and, and being taken advantage of when they bought farms. Now, a lot of times these farms were uh, Yankee farms that have been in production for decades, if not centuries, owned by the remnants of those Yankee communities. But at the, from the 1890s, really to World War II, people were moving out of farming areas in Connecticut by the droves. There were new opportunities to work for factories, especially during World War I, where production was up. People moved out of the country into the cities. The Yankee farm families moved out. And this created an opening for ethnic farmers, including uh, not only Jews, but Italians and Poles as well, too. So in 1908, the Jewish Agricultural Aid Society uh, revamped its assistance program. And they added four new features. One was that they created an extension department. An extension department had a Yiddish-speaking farm agent. So if you were an isolated farm family, this is someone who would come through, be able to explain scientific or new farming techniques to you in Yiddish, and kind of break that isolation. And of course, all the ag schools in the country also developed these uh, agents, farm agents. But the JAF hired farm agents that were Yiddish speakers in many of the states that they had a large number of farmers in. The second thing that they did was to create a um, employment bureau. So if you were in New York City and you wanted to try out farming, you could actually go work on a farm for a certain length of time and see if you really like it. Farming is one of those things that's either, you either like it or you don't. <laughs> and there, there's, I hear a lot of farming families, I guess the second and third generation where the kids or the grandkids are saying, oh my gosh, we had to do all this work and it was terrible and my father made me you know, go out and clean the barn and we, we have to do all these chickens. And so it's either it's something you either like or you don't like. So almost like having an internship, you could, you could find a uh, family to live with and work on a farm. The third thing that they put in place were scholarships for farm families. So that second generation or first generation born here that could speak English that wanted to continue in farming could go to the University of Connecticut, for example, to the egg school. And then the last thing is that they would uh, provide a, uh, in addition to an agent, they had a Yiddish farm magazine called the Yiddisher Farmer. And when it started production, it, it was always advertised as the only Yiddish farm magazine in the world. <laughs> and we've always thought, yeah, that's probably right. <laughs> uh, it was all in Yiddish, and what they would do is um, often take photos or drawings from far other farm magazines that were in English and put them in the Yiddish or farmer, write the text in Yiddish. The illustrations in the magazine sometimes would still be in English because I got them from another farm journal. Um, and then they also developed different, sometimes there's not a word, a Yiddish word that would properly describe something. So then they plunk the, the English word in. So uh, eventually it goes to, it, it, it goes to a half and half where it's printed in Yiddish and English, and then it goes to an all English version. But I'm telling you, I'm sitting there in the, the American Jewish Historical Society's archives room, surrounded by these Yiddish farm magazines, as far as the eye can see. And it's maddening to me not to know what it says. So we, because uh, every once in a while you almost even see Connecticut in it. You know? <laughs> so so um, over the years, we've worked with a number of Jewish interpreters which has been really helpful to say the least. So, uh, and the last big piece of the puzzle was that they would uh, provide uh, loans. So they would provide first or second mortgages. Now the farm agent would go out and identify farms that were for sale. And there were farms galore 
The state was worried in 1910 about abandoned, what they were calling abandoned farms. There were a lot to choose from. The farm agent would go out and inspect the farm before settling a Jewish farmer on that farm. So they would uh, try to look at uh, the buildings that were on the property. They would look for properties that had farm wagons, cars, and trucks are often cited in the deeds to these properties. And according to the uh, Jewish Agricultural Society's general manager, Leonard G. Robinson, it's more important to help a man locate on a farm which he can make a living than to help him with a loan on a farm that he cannot make a living on. In granting mortgages, the JAS frequently wrote into the deeds stern stipulations that the farmer was required to keep, at, such as the following directives. Keep the property insured against fire. Occupy the, the residences, uh, live there, commit no waste thereon, engage in no change in ownership, cultivate said farm, and pay the taxes. In exchange, the JAS agreed to take a second or third position among creditors. One deed gave a farmer $1,200 for 150 acres of land with buildings in, uh, on the Columbia Hebron line that was already encumbered with a first mortgage of $2,100 and a lien of $1,900. The schedule of payments for the principal called for a payment of $150 annually from 1924 to 1927, $200 annually thereafter, and interest at 5%. The JAS screened potential applicants and rejected mortgage applications from individuals who had less than $400 to $1,200 in capital. But some farmers still defaulted, leaving the JAS battle to bad debts. A 1923 Harper Current article reported that the JAS had fined Jacob fined $3,565.41 due to a mortgage on a farm in Thompsonville. The JAS won the suit in court, but they'd already been forced to pay the taxes and other bills for over a year. Um, as I said before, there's two synagogues in the state that have records that show that the Baron of Hirschman provided direct support for those. The Chesterfield uh, Synagogue has, uh, as you said, been a victim of arson, but now it's a historic archeological site. But these are some of, I'm gonna run through some of the other country synagogues that we discovered when we did our project. This is a Buddhist Akim Synagogue, 1927, enlarged in 1951. It's on State Route, State Route 87 in Chestnut Hill, Columbia. This was built by seven or eight of the, of the congregation's farm families. It's at a, a crossroads. The land was donated by the Kaplan family next door. And if you drove by it quickly, it almost looked like a schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse, and, or two-room schoolhouse. And it's distinguished by its Mogan David on the, on the front. Now, the interiors of these country synagogues are a little bit of Russia on the inside. They're very American on the outside and very, very Jewish on the inside. This is Hebron, and I think we have somebody from the Hebron area here today. Built in 1940 at 10 Church Street. It's literally at the four corners of Hebron. It's down, literally down the block from the Congregational Church. This, was, this is an interesting one because it was designed by a member of the congregation. He was somebody that whose family had, when he was a child, had moved his family onto a farm in Connecticut. They hadn't made it, they'd moved back to New York City. He and his brother and his father tried again in another place in Connecticut near Hebron, uh, kept the farm going, but didn't really make a lot of money. And then this, the gentleman who designed this, uh, actually, Char it's Ira Charles Tertian, he actually was a very talented artist. And if he hadn't been an adolescent, I think during the Great Depression, he would have actually wanted to pursue a career as an artist. But it was the Great Depression. He, his family was unable to send him to school. So he actually buys a feed store and demonstrates there's a big Jewish shift from farming into feed stores and other agricultural uh, implement type stores, as well as small downtown stores in these agricultural towns. So anyway, so he came from Russia, bounced back and forth New York City to Connecticut, Finally, in 1924, he bought a general store known as the Amston Grain Mill in Amston, Connecticut, which is a few miles from Colchester. 
He designed this building when built during the Depression when building materials were hard to get. It was built in 1940 when they had started to already ration building goods because of the oncoming onset of war. Uh, and so it's made out of used bricks that were hand cleaned and assembled by the congregation. The interior is interesting because it has uh, two murals, one on either side, and we haven't figured out the artist. I don't know if Tertian himself painted those, but it's a unique feature. This, this is Anti Israel of Lisbon, 1936. Uh, this one is on a bend of a country road, and if you came by it on a school bus, you would definitely think it was a one-room schoolhouse or a Grange building. Um, this one was also built by the congregation. And when that congregation finally got to the point where there weren't, uh, the congregation members were elderly and there weren't 10 men to form a minion to really have services. Uh, there was great concern because it sits there on a, on a country road pretty much by itself. And there was great concern about what would happen to it. So the historical society actually uh, worked with the town and they bought the building. And so now it's preserved as a museum. So if, uh, if you ever take a, you, you can make arrangements to see the inside of this one. It's been restored. They found some interesting features like there's, a, there's blue trim on the windowsills, and blue is a very important spiritual color in Judaism. <coughs> so they uh, did a great job with that. Now this one's got to be very familiar to everybody in the room. This is Knesset Israel, 1913. And this is the, the, the second one, and the only existing one out there right now, that was actually supported by the Baron de Hirsch Fund directly. So it's a well-proportioned building. It's been moved once. It's very colonial revival. Uh, local historian Dorothy Conan notes that the plans call for a modest wooden structure with two rooms, partitioned off by a four-foot-high wall topped by a row of windows. In keeping with Orthodox tradition, the room would contain an ark, which is where the Torah scrolls are. And that was in the main area was for men's seating. And the second area was for women's seating. The women's section can also be used for recreational purposes and contain a pot belly stove. Of the total of $1,500 the building cost, $100 was donated by Jacob Schiff, a board member of the Jewish Agricultural Society in New York, and uh, part of the balance from the uh, Baron de Hirsch Fund. $50. Now this is, the, uh, this is the only one we found in Western Connecticut. And the, this, the area that this synagogue is in is actually known locally as Little Palestine. Uh, so this one was built in, it was built in 1919. And the um, congregation once again donated the building materials and the land that it sits on. It was part of a larger farm owned by a Russian Jewish farmer farming family. And summer visitors from New York would attend services in the synagogue too. So it's, it's really in that Litchfield uh, recreational kind of area. In, two, in 2007, the congregation vacated the building. They built a new building. So the future of this one is a little bit up in the air. If you were a Jewish farmer, you had to make ends meet. And we've talked about things like piecework for the garment industry. We've talked about going into larger cities in your, in your area to work over the winter. But something that became very popular was uh, really raising a crop of tourists. So by the 1910s, many, Germ many Jewish farmers had begun supplementing their, in their income by taking in summer boarders. So going to the country in the summer was a well-accepted tradition of really among all classes of America Americans. Farm families found themselves catering to fellow Jews who were drawn by the promise of fresh food prepared in kosher kitchens, local synagogues in which to worship, and a respite from the hot, smoldering summers in New York City tenements. The host farmers could be counted on to uphold Jewish dietary laws. They engaged the services of the right kind of slaughter for the meat and for fowl. And by the 1920s, kosher, kosher butcher shops could be found in a number of small uh, country communities, such as Colchester. One former resident recalled, there was a, a kosher butcher, and I still remember where it was. A little house right across the street from the Colchester laundry. The shookets were there to take care of the chickens. My 
My father would bring them on the same bus my sister and I would take to school. And she was mortified that he did that. But, um, in 1928, the Hart Hartford Current reporter, Isabel Foster, described the summer influx of Jews to Colchester in central Connecticut. That was an area that became known as the Connecticut Catskills. And she says, she says in the paper in 1928, in the summer, the population jumps to 10,000 because of some, of some are visitors from the tenements of New York. Those who do not like to see a dignified and quiet old town turned into a resort for summer workers should soften their hearts by spending a hot week in August sleeping on a cor courtyard in the Upper East Side of New York. It would then be a matter of rejoicing that these poor people could get away to the green country for a few weeks. They will look with delight into the shed labeled banquet hall with a large table and two benches to serve as the only furniture and at the hammock slung in the rundown apple orchard even the noisy groups who gather in the town's little stores. In Yiddish, a kaka lane is a cook-for-yourself arrangement. Now, that meant that you rented your sleeping rooms from the farm wife, but she didn't cook for you. You bought your materials, your, your eggs and milk and butter and everything from the farm family, and you did your own cooking, usually outside in, a, in what was called a summer kitchen. I even remember those when I was a kid. But a summer kitchen where uh, you could do canning, you could do large-scale cooking outside, and not steam up your house. Um, the, this that's kind of set up, the Kaka Lane set up, let farmers profit not only from collecting <coughs> weekly rent, but also by selling fresh ingredients to guests. Saul Mendel described the motley collection of buildings that made up the guest rooms at his parish farms. He says, there were several bungalows. One was originally an ice house. One was originally a chicken coop. The city of Norwich disposed of their trolley cars, and we were able to obtain one and turn it into a bungalow. There were also boarding houses that provided both meals and rooms, although that was less common. That's the same building we just saw in uh, Colchester. That was, that's the proprietor. This was a big farms, farmhouse that was bought that was used as a uh, boarding house for the summer guests. This was a small resort. Now, the, the Jewish farmsteads that we see that have uh, separate buildings built for summer guests and the small resorts that develop are principally very kind of work, really working class kind of families would go to. They, they were not extravagant, they weren't super expensive. Um, so this type of small resort developed. You'd have a, the swimming pool was always the major feature. Um, this is the kind of place you could you, you, you would go for walks in the country, you'd play tennis, you'd go to the pool, you would do activities that they arranged for you. Can you show the video picture here? Let's see. Not, no. Oh, okay. Um, and when we researched these, we found that, that we found more than 30 of these small resorts. So they included boarding houses, cottages, hotels, bungalows, and camps. They usually had waterfront recreation, dining halls, and nightly entertainment. Famous entertainers such as Zero Mostel traveled a, a Jewish summer resort circuit that included venues in New York, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. Zero Mostel's first cousin actually owned Banner Lodge, which was started on the uh, on his. his Father's farm in Moodis, Connecticut. That's Grand Lodge in Lebanon. This is the Storrs Hotel in Manchester. 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 <laughs> I work in Manchester, you can tell. Yeah. The these are these are the stores have Jewish farms and Jewish settlers. Yep. The, these are two of the visitors. Oh, Shack, really. <laughs> now, Banner Lodge was 
uh, started in 1934 on the site of Jack Banner's father's farm in Lutus. The resort was known for hosting prominent comedians. Uh, and I always heard that story that his cousin was Zero Mostel and that he would stop and perform there. And sure enough, when I gave this talk in Middletown, somebody actually was also related to Jack Banner and said that was absolutely true. And they remembered him playing poker after the, after the guests had all you know, gone back to their rooms. You can see the kind of advertising that was done. Now, a lot of people actually met their husbands or wives at these camps uh, or resorts, either by working there or coming as a visitor. This is a separate property that they folded into their whole lodge area. This is another small resort in uh, East Haddam, I think. And then they also, there was also sort of a spin-off with these small uh, dry goods stores. And Zucker Bombs is in Jewett City, and it was some place that advertised that they had just about everything. And Mr. Zuckerbaum stayed in business, the second generation stayed in business until two years ago when he died. And I think if people here are probably familiar with Marlowe's, for example, Zuckerbaum's was the country version of Marlowe's. <laughs> you could walk in and you could have girls from the 1960s next to some up-to-date you know, marker set, you know, everything in between. Um, so, we, in uh, conclusion, we want to talk a little bit about what, what worked and what didn't work in making a success of this. Now, uh, in the decade that followed World War I, more than a thousand Jewish farm families settled in Connecticut. That's a lot of folks. From 1900 to 1933, the JAS made 2,248 loans in Connecticut, over a million dollars to 2,183 borrowers on 1,085 farms. Several farm, some farmers received more than one loan. Um, and, you know, these Jewish farmers were really bucking a lot of economic trends. Not surprisingly, a, a lot of them did not make it. You've got the things that, that torpedo farmers in general. You've got economic panics, you've got depressions, collapse of farm prices, and all those occur with regularity, compounding the idea that these are brand new farmers carving out a new life in a new country. Still, many did survive, and not only survive, but thrive. What distinguishes those Connecticut Jewish farmers who made it from the ones who failed? Well, in most cases, it was just good luck. A good location with close proximity to urban areas, including Hartford, New Haven, New London, Norwich, and Willimantic, that provided high demand for fresh eggs, milk, and meat, and that, could, that afforded access to trolley, truck, and train to transport produce to the market. I had to explain to my daughter in college what I meant by, are we on the milk run for Metro North where they stop at every stop? And being on the milk run meant you stopped at every stop because you picked up milk cans for farmers who lugged them to the train stop. So that expression had gone out of uh, usage, I guess, completely. But in Connecticut, there were great trolley lines, there were great train lines, and stuff would be sent into the city. Um, they also had good soil, well, soil from the Connecticut River Valley. That allowed uh, the group of Farmington, uh, or, uh, farmers in the Ellington region to really cultivate things like to, uh, profitable tobacco crops. While important discoveries such as milk, vitamin A, promoted the idea that you were going to feed milk to children, which sounds obvious now, but that was actually a major move. And it had to be prepared in a sanitary fashion, and so mothers had to be convinced of the idea that you would give milk to children. And we also had the help of the Connecticut Agricultural College at Stores, where the first Jewish student was enrolled in 1898, and the State Department of Agriculture and its agents ended farmers' isolation and kept them informed. But Jewish farmers also had a powerful ally, ally in the Jewish Agricultural Society. It provided its own farm agents, farm publications in Yiddish and English, and most importantly, money to lend, often as a second or third mortgage. These materials all supplemented and supported individual farm families' own ingenuity and their business savvy 
and turning old family farms into flourishing dairy or poultry farms or summer resorts. <coughs> so we have only begun to scratch the surface on this story. And what I, as I said at the beginning, what I'd love to encourage you to do is to look for those stories and pictures here in Vernon or if you're from Ellington, the same thing. And also, we will be working on another volume. We looked at Jewish farmers <coughs> from about 1880 to 1945. But there's another story that needs to be told from 1945 to 1975. Because we, you had an influx of new Jew Jewish farmers that came after the war that were displaced persons or resettled after the war. And so some of those country synagogues, like the one in Columbia, for example, had to be enlarged to include new farmers that came after the Second War. So we, uh, the Jewish Historical Society and I are going to start working on that next volume. And so there's, there's plenty more stories to tell. Now with that, I'd love to see if there are any comments or recollections from the audience on this. I know there's several farming families here. You had one. Rockefeller committed, contributed $50 to the Ellington Synagogue construction, which my mother got from him. Wow, I'm going to get your name after this. The gentleman says, uh, what's your name? Ed Lovett. Ed says that uh, his, mother, his mother managed to get $50 from a Rockefeller for the Ellington Synagogue. And I, that's great. I don't think we it was have built across from our house. So, that's super. Yeah, just a question. Have you ever thought about including the Jewish cemeteries in with the synagogue? Always mentioned the one was on the history channel. Oh, one on the history channel? Okay. History the, uh, all right, there was a, I got a call one day uh, at my desk from the producers of the History Detectives, which is a show on uh, PBS, and they had a question from a homeowner <coughs> that East Haddam had or Haddam that had pulled out these Yiddish newspapers from walls when they were doing construction. And they were trying to figure out how these Yiddish newspapers got in this idyllic, idyllic country setting in Connecticut and uh, in this very historic house. So that led them to decide to pursue that story. So they filmed that story in Connecticut. They interviewed me. And they wanted to know uh, the story, how we got, how Jewish farmers made it to Connecticut. And that was a, that was an interesting property because they had a historian research all the owners for about 100 years on that property, and it changed hands over and over and over again. And it kind of, uh, Jewish hands, and it kind of gave you the idea of how hard and formidable that lifestyle is. It was not a lifestyle that uh, to be taken lightly. It's, a, it's pretty tough. And so that property that they showed on the history detectors has changed hands many times. 
people had moved back to New York City or had moved to Bridgeport or bigger towns. Um, if students want to do uh, research on this topic, where, where, where should I send them? Okay, the, uh, the State Library in Hartford has pulled together, and on their website, they have a guide to the resources that they have on Jewish farmers, and then it's the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford, <coughs> which is in West Hartford. They have a, a nice website. Uh, let me hold up the book. I brought, uh, I brought three copies of the book that I'd be happy to sell for you today. All proceeds going to the Jewish Historical Society, or you can also order it on their website. But uh, they, they work with students, and they love to work with students. And oh yeah, and they also carry this book, which I have a piece in this book on Jewish farmers. But this covers a lot of other really great topics. Well, thank you so much. I'm sorry for the tech problems at the beginning, but thank you so much.